Hello students, welcome back to the course on organizational behavior, individual dynamics in organization. Today we move to the second lecture of the fifth module, personality. We had actually looked into personality in general. We had introduced to the concepts of personality in general. Now we look into certain important theories in personality. So we start with certain types of trait theories. So the theme for today's lecture would be trait theories focus on identifying and describing the fundamental traits that make up an individual's personality. So when we talk about personality, we have already established that personality is a multi-dimensional concept and taking a cue from that per, uh, particular idea, we tend to develop or dig into the trait theories specifically. So when we look into the trait theories, we have to understand and acknowledge the fact that trait theories of personality generally aim to understand and categorize individual differences in people's characteristic patterns of behavior, emotion and thoughts. So this makes essentially the personality a multi-dimensional concept. When you are looking into personality, the ramifications of that, you will understand that it is not only the behavior, but also the emotions and even the thoughts that are being influenced and if I can use the word manipulated because of your personality or how your personality is actually designed or what your personality actually is. So some of the essential theories we look into that in detail. We'll start with Cattell's 16 personality factors when we look into the big five model. This is one of the most sought after famous theories and then we'll also look into the Firo B model. So let's start with the Cattell's model. When we look into the Cattell's 16 personality factors as suggested, this 16 P of our 16 personality factors are the critical factors or is the key word when it comes to this particular theory. Raymond Cattell, a prominent psychologist, developed this 16 personality factors as part of his comprehensive study of personality. So the 16 personality factor questionnaire, the 16 PF questionnaire specifically, it's nothing but an inventory, it's a questionnaire, is a comprehensive measure of normal range personality and found to be effective in a variety of settings where an in-depth assessment of the whole person is required. So when, if we, if we trace the, the origin of the 16 personality factors and the questionnaire in particular, we see that from the inception of this particular questionnaire, as a multi-level measure of personality, it has, it has gained prominence because of the factor analytic theory altogether of Cattell. So when we look into the, the theory in general, we understand and we tend to acknowledge the fact that 16 personality factors are identified and this is certain inventory or a questionnaire which it looks into those uh, factors and those 16 factors can be corroborated or correlated with what you are. So this gives a fundamental analysis of what your personality is. When we look into the next important model, it's the big five personality. Generally, we, we hear it as ocean model, etc. for the ease of remembrance and all. Now let's look into the big five personality theory in detail. When we look into the big five personality model, there are specifically five models. We, we tend to have different orders in different textbooks, but these are essentially the five. One is extraversion, second is agreeableness, third is conscientiousness, fourth is emotional stability, and the fifth is openness to experience. When we look into these factors one by one, as I've already mentioned in different textbooks, you go by different order. You have sometimes uh, uh, starting from the openness, that's why ocean has come in, openness, conscientiousness, um, you know, extraversion, agreeableness and neuroticism. So when you look into specific factors, let's look into extraversion first. Extraversion is more of the sociability factor. How much you are sociable, how much you are active in an environment, how much you are sort of courteous in an organizational setup, how much you are uh, uh, less introvert and more of extrovert. So all these factors come under the bigger umbrella of extraversion where the, the, the sociability index or the sociability angle is actually being deciphered. 
So, this is the first and the foremost factor in the big five. The second one is agreeableness. As the term suggests, agreeableness is nothing but the, the, the way you actually agree to a particular thing or it is a more refined way of thinking would be to have a certain uh, affinity or certain uh, certain uh, likability in the in the organizational environment you are you are agreeable to things you are the right person you don't create uh, problems you are not fussy about things you are generally open to agreements so all these aspects are uh, listed under agreeableness and i'm just giving you some flavors of what agreeableness specifically means when we look into the third factors which is conscientiousness conscientiousness is more about being order in 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 uh, not in a chaotic environment being very meticulous being uh, systematic organized dependable reliable so all these factors come under what is known as the conscientiousness element or conscientiousness factor you are a person who is dependable in an organization you are a person who is reliable for any particular task given by your your boss or your colleagues then you are more on the scale of conscientiousness so this is one of the most important factor when we look into the big five in general because in an organizational behavioral management domain obm domain we'll see and understand that openness is important but conscientiousness is more relevant in an organizational setup emotional stability is also known as neuroticism which is another important factor and it essentially means that how you react to those stimuli that can trigger emotional instability or emotional stability so this is what neuroticism actually means so higher you are your score or your factors in neuroticism you are actually poor in terms of managing your emotional factors or you are poor in managing your emotions as such so this is yet another important factor in the big five personality model and finally we come to the openness of the experience openness to experience and this is not mere openness where you look into openness on 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 an on as a extraversion or as a as a person who is more extrovert no rather than that it is being open to experiences you are open to changes you are the person who can take up new challenges you are the person who can take up new tasks you are the person who can actually you know come up with suggestions and voluntarily take up risk you can voluntarily take up tasks you can voluntarily take up assignments you are that person you are that individual and this is what openness to experience means you are you are okay to be posted at some places where others generally hesitate to go you are a person who has no hesitation in taking up new responsibilities which otherwise were deemed to be difficult or herculean tasks so all these factors they are they come under openness to experience so big five personality is a much broader scale which defines the personality into different segments uh, be it extraversion be it agreeableness be it conscientiousness be it emotional stability and be it openness to experience so you, what you are as an individual try to introspect there are certain inventories that come your way when you actually search for these personality factors from these inventories you get a clear cut idea you get a very lucid picture of what you are what your personality is and based on that you can even go for the right job you are or right job you want right or right job you deserve so all these factors right from recruitment selection your training program your career progression your uh, you know uh, even uh, to extend that how much you contribute to the organization what would be your essential contribution over your entire life span within the organization everything every single factor to a certain extent is dependable on your personality and this big five personality essentially gives you an insight into what is your personality so this covers a lot of broad factors as i've already discussed next the third important theory would be 
fundamental interpersonal relations orientation we also call as fero b is a theory that was developed by will shuts so when you look into this particular theory it focuses on understanding interpersonal relations particularly in group settings so when you are part of a team when you are part of a group how you actually develop your interpersonal relationship how you are actually mingling with others how you are actually are you cooperative enough are you a person who is fussy about things are you a person who is not a good team player all those aspects are captured under the interpersonal relations orientation fir theory outlines how individuals tend to behave in social situations and describe three fundamental needs that influence interpersonal interaction one being inclusion second being control and affection so essentially though it captures or tries to capture the individual predisposition of personality it is captured in a group setting so how effective you are how sociable you are how good you are in a social situation this is the vital factor so inclusion control and affection are the three factors or the are the three three uh, interpersonal interactions that are being controlled based on this particular theory now let's look into the another dimension of personality theory which is psychodynamic or psychoanalytical theories of personality so till now we were looking into trait theories either individuals are open the personality depends on uh, certain traits like openness certain certain traits like extraversion or certain uh, you know uh, factors like how they are uh, mingling within the within the group what is their uh, social quotient so all these factors essentially come from what trait they are uh, primarily based off so this was the background of trait theory now when we look into a different angle altogether in personality there is something called as psychodynamic theories or psychoanalytical theories which will uh, you know shortly look into these theories this psychodynamic theories emphasize the role of unconscious processes and inner conflicts in shaping human behavior emotions and personality development so please understand it's not only the trait that is driving a, a, an individual's personality or in effect the human behavior and emotions rather it could be the unconscious processes so when you are looking into unconscious processes it is a world which is generally uh, not in the limelight or let me put it like this this is something which is beyond our control or something which is beyond our comprehension at times so we are not an individual who are actually always aware of what is going in our unconscious sometimes sometimes certain factors influence some behavioral uh, you know uh, accidents actually influence there is no doubt about it there are some situations which actually have clear cut say or they actually handhold your unconscious behavioral patterns or unconscious processes but to a certain extent we are not aware of exactly what is happening within the unconscious process and what are the internal conflicts that are emerging or that are ongoing within our personality so this wakes this makes the psychodynamic theory of personality very critical rather interesting so when you look into psychodynamic theory there is one name which we cannot forget and that is sigmund freud so ladies and gentlemen let's look into the freud's psychoanalytic theory and it forms the crux of the foundation of psychodynamic thought and other theorists like carl jung alfred adler erik erikson further expanded and modified the psychodynamic concepts so some of these theories generally fall under uh, these two categories one is this mbti which we we'll look in the next slide myers briggs which we we'll look in the next slide and we also look into sigmund freud's theory so when you are looking into mbti specifically myers briggs type indicator the mbti is the most widely used personality assessment instrument in the world so if you are a student of personality as a discipline you will obviously come across an inventory and the
cannot be a different inventory other than MBTI, which is the most common inventory or assessment instrument in the world that is used to assess the personality of any individual. So Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung proposed that personality is primarily represented by the individual's preferences regarding perceiving and judging information. So we are actually migrating from the trait aspect to perceiving and judging information. So here the individual takes the front seat, his perception about the information he is having, his judgment about the information he is having takes the front seat. So Carl Jung explained that perceiving which involves how people prefer to gather information or perceive the world around them occurs through two competing orientation which is typically sensing and intuition. So when you are looking into the aspects of how individual preferences are oriented with respect to perceiving and judging, this happens or this orientation is manifested essentially through sensing and intuition. These are the two important aspects. If you look into any, any single reactive phenomena, what we are facing or what we generally do, if we closely observe our own actions, we generally respond in two ways. One is we sense something and that is the, the input that is coming to us. Another is that we have some intuition about something that's going to happen. So unless and until you don't have any other third mechanism coming towards you with respect to the information available with you, this too, sensing and intuition acts as the prominent drivers or prominent thrust makers for your personality dispositions. So please understand, when you are looking into your perception and your judgment of information, it is certainly done through sensing and intuition phenomena. So when Young, Carl Young expressed or proposed that judging how people process information or make decision based on what they have perceived consists of two competing process which is thinking and feeling. So we are coming to a second category of aspects where the processing of information is happening with respect to thinking and feeling. When you are looking into the first phase of thing, when you are, when when individual is gathering information and perceiving the world around them, it was more of sensing and intuition. But when people actually start processing information or start to make decisions based on what they have perceived, the second stage comes in and that is essentially embellished by thinking and feeling. So this is where the trait theorist and when you look into the psychodynamic theories, theorists actually vary. They are more psychodynamic theories, theorists are mainly, psychodynamic theories are mainly looking into uh, the factors such as individual preferences, they are looking into factors like how they perceive the world and when it comes to perceiving the information what they have in their hand, it, it happens through the sensing and intuition and when the perception is over and people tend to process this information and tend to make decisions, it happens to thinking and feeling. So this is essentially what we know about Carl Jung and his theory. Now let's look into the dynamic theory of personality where we have to thank Sigmund Freud. So the structural model of personality was proposed by Sigmund Freud and describes that the interaction and organization of three major components of human psyche. So remember, if you are to discuss Sigmund Freud, you have to have three important words or keywords. One is id, second is ego, and the third one is superego. Id, ego, and superego. So this is what we should understand first. Id is something which is more of your primitive instinctual part of the mind. When you are looking into your aggressive drives, your sexual drives, your hidden memories, all this that is being kept under your, you know, uh, primitive mind or the instinctual part of the mind, this is what is qualified as it. When you look into other factors like superego, Let's look into superego. Superego operates as more of the moral side, the moral conscience. 
the moral part which is the upright part the the moral uh, you know uh, judge that would be the super ego and when you come into the most realistic part that mediates that acts as a wire media between the id and super ego is the ego so you we have three essential components when it comes to sigmund freud and his theory one is id super ego and e ego i repeat it is more of your primitive mind it is more of the hidden memories it is more of your sexual and aggressive drives that are going on whereas super ego is the diametrically opposite uh, scenario which takes the moral conscience part which takes the moral uh, you know judge part and when you look into the realistic part of your mind that's ego that's where you actually tend to do something or th that is where actually the thought process happen so dynamic theory of personality cannot be you know proceeded without the proper understanding of id ego and super ego the interactions among these three id ego and super ego create a dynamic and often conflicting this is relevant it is not only dynamic but it's also conflicting internal psychological landscape conflicts between these psychic forces can lead to inner tensions anxieties and even psychological distress so when you are looking into freud's psychoanalytic theory the mismatch or the conflict that's happening the dissonance that's happening the problems or the conflict the ever ever going conflict happening between your id super ego specifically and the ego in between this creates a lot of distress psychological distress this creates a lot of tensions this creates a lot of anxieties so all these psychic forces the 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 uh, happening or the dynamics between these forces they are the root cause for all your psychological distress so this is what dynamic theory of personality specifies now let's come into type a and type b personality so this this is again much quoted much referred personality theory type a versus type b type a and type b personality theories are specifically two distinct personality types proposed in the 50s by cardiologist mayer friedman and ray rosenman based on the studies regarding the correlation between personality traits and coronary heart disease so when you are actually looking into type a and type b type personality type a personality characteristics generally include uh, people who are highly competitive ambitious assertive impatient time conscious and even aggressive so so if you are a person who is more ambitious uh, more assertive but impatient and yet you are time conscious and somewhere you have these these elements which can actually define or describe you you are a type a personality on the other hand if you are more relaxed you are more laid back less focused on competition and achievement then you are more of a type b personality so this is what makes a clear distinction between type a personality and type b personality type a is a person who is more competitive more ambitious he is always assertive there is a lot of impatience that's happening and natural outcome it is because you are more competitive you want to be uh, you know the top in every field you want to excel in your domain you are then obviously as a consequence you are time conscious you are aggressive you are assertive you are impatient so all these factors are generally being uh, you know uh, uh, clubbed under type a personality but if you are more relaxed more laid back you are type b personality so this gives you a chance of understanding what you are specifically are you a type a personality are you a type b personality so more than just theoretical understanding of the course you should be in a position to introspect within yourself in your organizational domain in your workplace what are you are you a type a personality or are you a type b personality or are you a type a personality because of some external influences because of some factors which otherwise is going against your personality 
segment altogether. You were initially a type B personality, but because of some external forces, some coercion, some factors, are you actually a type A personality or type B personality? So this makes uh, this brings a lot of clarity into your personality understanding. So let's look into uh, a small uh, situational case. Is there a price for being too nice? Agreeable people tend to be kinder and more accommodating in social situations, which you might think could add to their success in life. However, we have already noted that one downside of agreeableness is potentially lower earnings. We are not sure why this is so, but agreeable individuals may be less aggressive in negotiating, starting salaries and pay rises. This is the justification that they are giving. Yet, there is clear evidence that agreeableness is something employers value. Several books argue in favor of leading with kindness and capitalizing on kindness, etc. So, other articles in the business press have argued that sensitive, agreeable CEO signals a shift in business culture. In many circles, individuals desiring success in their careers are exhorted to be complimentary, kind and good. Take the example of 500 employee Lindblad Expeditions. It emphasizes agreeableness in its hiring decisions. The VP of HR commented, you can teach people any technical skills, but you can't teach them how to be kind-hearted, generous-minded person with an open spirit. So while employers want agreeable employees, agreeable employees are not better job performers and they are less successful in their careers. We might explain this apparent contradiction by noting that employers value agreeable employees for other reasons. They are more pleasant to be around and they may, be, they may help others in ways that aren't reflected in their job performance. Most evidence suggests that agreeable people like agreeable people, which you might expect because people like those who are similar to themselves. However, even disagreeable people like agreeable people. And this is the catch. Perhaps because they are easier to manipulate than individuals who are lower in agreeableness. Perhaps everyone wants to hire agreeable people just because everyone likes to be around them. Moreover, a 2008 study of CEO and CEO candidates revealed that this contradiction applies to organizational leaders as well. Using ratings made by an executive search firm, researchers studied that the personalities and abilities of 316 CEO candidates for companies involved in buyout and venture capital, capital transactions. They found that what gets a CEO candidate hired is not what makes him or her effective. I repeat. What gets a CEO candidate higher is not what makes him or her effective. Specifically, CEO candidates who were rated high on nice traits such as respecting others, developing others, and teamwork were more likely to be hired. However, these same characteristics, especially teamwork and respecting others for venture capital CEOs, made the organization they led less successful. So when we look into this, this case uh, generally, what we understand is that there are some, some pertinent questions that come our way. Do you think there's a contradiction between what employers want in employees being, I'm, I'm just looking into the agreeable employee case and what employees actually do best when, when the cases of disagreeable employees come. So why and why not? Just ponder over. Often, the second question is, the effects of personality depend on the situation. Can you think of some job situations in which agreeableness is an important value and in which it is harmful? So this is an open-ended question you can always answer based on the experience you are having. So this is where I wanted to give you some input into the general theories that are followed in personality. The general theories that are being uh, uh, referred in personality. There are trade theories which we have looked into. There are certain theories which generally look into the intuition, the sensing, the thinking, the feeling. There are certain theories which look into your inner self, your id, 
your your primitive mind which which is having a lot of you know uh, uh, desires and aggressions etc or something which looks into the super ego which has your moral conscience and all these theories have some contribution or have done some contribution to the world of personality in understanding personality better i just like to conclude with one thought you look into your workplace there might be some individuals who are always agreeable to things they might be the most efficient ones they might be the most effective ones they might be the only ones who are ready to work hard it could be you it might not be you but please think of those situations which where you are not agreeable to certain things you are not agreeable to certain things does not give you an authority to not work it gives you definitely a confidence and it gives you a certain uh, you know it it is only natural that you can put your disagreement to a certain thing but it will not give you uh, any or it uh, idea or it will not warrant any authority for not working or not being part of the team so please understand agreeableness is a virtue try to have it but when it comes to work you also have to be assertive you also have to be critical and also have to be accommodative on that note we'll end today's class we'll look into more of personality and its details in the next class thank you for listening to me patiently take care bye bye